It's a great day for Army talent management reform. I mean, when you look at things, what more could you ask for? The uh, Congress signaled its attitude when it said uh, it's time to modernize the 38-year-old personnel officer personnel system. Uh, S Department of Defense signaled it's going to provide re reinforcing fires in the national defense strategy when they said it's time for a broad revision of talent management in the armed services. Uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, when he was the Secretary of the Army, said talent management is his number one priority. Uh, the Secretary of the Army backs it 100 percent. The Chief of Staff of the Army was a former G1 and is a big advocate for talent management. Casey Wardinsky, one of the early champions of talent management, is now the ASA and MNRA. The Army Talent Management Task Force has been reinvigorated and capably led. What more could you ask? The conditions have been set. Never has there been a time with greater potential for major transformational change in the officer career management system in the Army than today. So what could possibly hinder <laughs> this historic <laughs> and profound occasion? Well, the answer is, unfortunately, the Army culture. And so the Army culture consists of uh, those discrete things that influence decision making, that, qu that quietly affect our behavior that we never speak about, those norms and beliefs. And unfortunately, it's the Army culture that will drag its feet when Army transformation in talent management is attempted. Well, probably uh, the first cultural line of defense that we'll see approaching talent management is the, well, actually, for that matter, uh, it's always the first line of defense for any transformational change, and that is the perspective of, if it's not broken, why bother fixing it? And what that causes is it causes us to ask senior leaders to acknowledge that the system that chose them for success, that selected them as exemplars of success, that placed in their hands the stewardship of the profession, that system is somehow flawed and needs to be overhauled. So it's perfectly rational for senior leaders to say to themselves it makes no sense to go chasing a corporate fad and risk damaging the system that, while it's not perfect, is good enough. So this aspect of Army culture encourages uniform leaders to patiently wait out those civilian zealots, <laughs> hoping that despite all the high expectations of reform, only non-threatening initiatives like longer maternity leave, expanded childcare hours, and more mother's rooms will result. Another factor that will impede talent management reform is the Army's egalitarian nature. The Army prides itself on being the service that leaves no one behind, that treats everyone the same regardless of individual differences. So it was egalitarianism that pushes back hard against offering opportunities to high potential individuals while denying those opportunities to those with lesser talent. So it was egalitarianism that in 2004 said, let's send all majors to resident ILE instead of just the top 50%. It was egalitarianism in the FY07 captain's exodus crisis that said, let's offer a retention bonus to all captains, regardless of their record of performance and future potential. And it will be egalitarianism that goes against talent reform when a initiative will highlight a talent shortfall in a particular branch, a source of commission, a subgroup, or a subpopulation. Another odd aspect of the Army's culture that will push back against talent reform is loyalty. Army senior leaders are exceptionally loyal to their subordinates, especially those with whom they have served and sacrificed alongside in 18 years of war. There's a well-intentioned and totally understandable concern that altering the paths of success for these young warriors midstream in their career is essentially pulling the rug from out under them. That potent cultural norm of loyalty encourages the belief that maybe it's better to err in a way that honors their service, even if it ultimately inhibits the effectiveness of talent management reform. And the fourth aspect of Army culture that will uh, impede talent management reform, which is very popular across the entire Army, is skepticism. <laughs> I specialize in this. <laughs> <laughs> it's just part of the Army culture, especially when personnel issues are concerned. We've all heard the promises. We've all 
watched, watched to see if the walk matches the talk. We've heard the promises, and that's what the forces heard. They've heard the promises that a command in a training unit is on par with a command in a tactical unit. We've heard the promises that a tour as a mid-team advisor is career enhancing. The force is skeptical. And so when promotion results, when selection results finally match up the promises of talent management reform, then the force will believe it. But until then, they re remain skeptical and cynical. Finally, the Army rests on a foundation that extols the preeminence of the warfighter. From lessons learned in pre-commissioning, where order of merit is largely determined by PT results and platoon patrolling scores, to general officers bragging that they never served a day in the Pentagon, the warfighter is extolled and emulated. And this key component of the Army culture is often intimidating, but it's often underestimated in realizing how much it pushes back against reform. But unless the preeminence of the warfighter is preserved, the force will always be skeptical. And they will look askance at any talent management initiatives that try to put the right person in the right place at the right time. So how does talent management reform succeed in the Army without these foot-dragging effects of Army culture? Well, it be begins with reform being embraced, owned, and promoted by uniformed senior leaders. The mantle of transformation that right now rests on the shoulders of the civilian appointees has to be shifted onto the shoulders of uniformed senior leaders. There has to be open discussion about how the world's greatest army shouldn't put people into positions by making a phone call to an assignment officer, HRC. We have to really confront the fact that is the best army in the world assessing its people by spending two and a half minutes glancing at a photo, an ORB, and looking for code words in OERs? We have to have those hard discussions and we have to ask ourselves, is it time? because transformation is best executed when it comes from within. Uniform senior leaders have to be convinced and they have to convince themselves that change is not only necessary, but feasible and desired. On the other hand, talent reformers have to recognize the uniqueness of Army culture that makes the Army what it is. The Army's primary function is to fight the nation's wars and win, is to fight and win the nation's wars. So it is only logical to retain the essence of the warfighter culture. The 1997 OPMS 21 study recognized this and created the operations career field, which made career paths, albeit too narrow career paths, for warfighters. So today, talent management advocates have to face the fact that the force of tomorrow will still have to be run by warfighters who have not forgotten who soldiers are and what the nation demands of them. But by the same token, if warfighters are going to assume the bulk of the leadership positions, senior leadership positions in the Army, they cannot object. Matter of fact, they should desire to be sent off to graduate school, fellowships, and non-muddy boot broadening assignments. And they can't redefine broadening to include becoming an OC at the CTCs. Part of talent management reform is not only making sure we have the best warfighters, but also that we have leaders that can lead this enterprise. Finally, in order to address the distrust that the force has of all talent management reform, it's imperative that reform be transparent as possible. We need to know why AIM-2, now we won't get into that. Simulation should be run to project short-term and long-term implications. Pilot tests should be run across the Army to so we could adjust initiatives. And if we spot a talent shortfall in a particular branch, a particular source of commission, a particular subgroup, then we shouldn't discard the initiative but we should go to look and see why is there a talent shortfall and work to correct that instead of just throwing out every initiative. In rolling out talent management initiatives and reform, the force must be convinced that the policies, while not necessarily treating everyone the same, that they're reasonable, that they're fair, and that they're in the best interest of the nation, the Army, and the soldier. So in my short remarks today, my, I'm not trying to come up with any new directives or directions we should go or new initiatives. My point is just that as an army, we have a history of ignoring culture. And that today, the stage has been set. The key actors are in position to bring about a radical transformation in the army. We should not squander this rare opportunity 
by failing to recognize and adjust to the pervasiveness of Army culture. Thanks. Thanks, Lenny. I appreciate it.